Welcome to Living Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Well, hello again. I'm Pastor Kathleen Casper, and this is Living Word. Living Word is a teaching program, and we are working our way through the books of the Bible. We have completed the Gospel of Matthew, and today we are beginning the Gospel of John. Let's begin now with a word of prayer. Good and gracious Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for the day. It is indeed a beautiful day that you have made. And we rejoice in it. We rejoice in every one of the blessings that you have given to us. We thank you for your word. It is a living word and it is able to touch us and our lives in just the way that you would have us be touched today. And so we thank you for your word. And we ask now, Heavenly Father, that you would be present among us in your Holy Spirit, as we are studying this, this new book, the book of the Gospel of John, we pray, O oh Lord, it would be a blessing to us. It will be, I am sure, because it is, it is written by you. And so we thank you. We thank you for your servant, John, and we thank you for your Holy Spirit that inspired it. And so we pray this, and we thank you, and we bless you in Jesus' name. We have completed the Gospel of Matthew. And at the end of that gospel, we heard those very, very wonderful words of our Lord. And surely I am with you to the very end of the age. It is such a joy to know that our wonderful God will never leave us or forsake us. What comfort and peace it is to know that God is with us. Emmanuel, God with us. Today we begin the Gospel of John. It is my personal favorite of the four gospels. If we did not have the Gospel of John, there would actually be very much that we would not know about Jesus and we would not know about his relationship with his Father. The Gospel of John is quite different from Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Its difference is quite likely due to the fact that John had a closer relationship with Jesus than the other disciples did. At least it appears to be the case that, that he did have a closer relationship with Jesus than the others. Because you see, we hear him being referred to as the disciple whom Jesus loved. For sure we know that God loves everyone. Jesus loves everyone. But the relationship Jesus has with each of us is different. Our God would like to have a close personal relationship with each of us that is real, even intimate, but... The relationship God has with us is largely up to us. God will be as close to us as we allow him to be. If we hold God off and keep him at arm's length, that's exactly where he will be. If we want him to be close to us, that's where he will be. The testimony of Jesus we have recorded for us, known as the Gospel of John, reveals that John had a much closer relationship to Jesus, and it shows in what God's Holy Spirit has directed John to write. John's Gospel is, is simply deeper. It goes deeper into spiritual truths than do Matthew, Mark, and Luke. What is another interesting point to ponder about this is this. John, he... He was known as the, God, as the disciple whom Jesus loved, but he was also known as one of the sons of thunder. He and his brother James once suggested to Jesus that they call down fire from heaven to destroy some people who did not welcome Jesus into their village. Jesus promptly rebuked them. What is also interesting about John is this. He did not remain fiery and quick-tempered. Naturally, this is a testimony of how God is able to transform a life into the image of his son. We know that he didn't remain fiery and quick-tempered by reading the letters he wrote and are recorded for us in the scriptures. The letter of 1 John has John addressing his readers nine times as dear children. Truly, 
he allowed God's spirit to transform him as only the master potter could. Now let's begin the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Well, let's just start with, with verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John begins his Gospel in the beginning. The last time we heard those words, we were reading Genesis 1-1, and this is precisely the point and the connection the Holy Spirit wants us to make as we begin this Gospel. In Genesis 1-1 we read, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. God spoke the creation, the light, into being. God spoke on all six days of creation, and whatever God spoke, it came into being. Now, how did God speak? Well, God spoke in the exact same way we speak. He uses words. He used words, and the words God spoke could no more be separated from him than the words we speak can be separated from us. John 1.1 states in simple and clear words that the Word was present in the beginning. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now we know from the witness of the Bible that there is only one God. Moses, after giving the commandments to Israel, said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Having established that the Word was God, John goes on to write, He was with God in the beginning. This statement lets us know that the Word, though God, is also separate from God. The word He lets us know this. So somehow the Word is God and yet separate from God. We could find ourselves quite easily confused by this, except for the fact that God has revealed Himself in the Bible as three distinct persons, yet only one God. We could not know this except for the fact that God has given it to that, that information to us by revelation. God had to reveal to us his divine nature. We would never have figured out God's nature without God revealing it to us. The three persons of the Godhead are the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. From Scripture, we know that the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God. Yet we also know from Scripture that there are not three gods. There is just one God. All three persons of the Godhead were present at creation. They coexist. They are co-eternal. As members of the Trinity, all three are uncreated. They have always been. They always are. They always will be. The word he was with God in the beginning. Now we hear, hear through him. All things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. Through the word, all things were made. God said, let there be light, and there was light. God said, God spoke. God said, let there be an expanse between the waters to separate water from water, and it was so. God said, let the water under the sky be gathered to one place and let dry ground appear, and it was so. God said, let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it, according to their various kinds, and it was so. God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the sky to separate the day from the night and let them serve as signs to mark seasons and days and years. And let there be lights in the expanse of the sky to give light on the earth. And it was so. And God said, let the water teem with living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the sky. So God created the great creatures of the sea and every living and moving thing with which the water teems. And God said, let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds, livestock, creatures that move along the ground, and wild animals, each according to its kind, and it was so. Then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. 
So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female. He created them. Eight separate times God spoke. Eight separate times the word of God went out of God's mouth, and in all eight instances, whatever God spoke came into being. And at the conclusion of the six days of creation, we, we read, God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. Through him. Meaning, through the word, all things were made. Without him, without the word, nothing was made that has been made. In our day and age of unbelief and disbelief in a creator, we need to really hear what is written in this passage. Without him, without the word, nothing was made that has been made. Without the word, nothing was made. Paul wrote, For by him all things were created, things in heaven, and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He was before all things, and in him all things hold together. Without the word, nothing was made. All things, visible and invisible, were created by him. Let's look around us. If we can see it, it was created by the word of God. And if we can't see it, but it exists, it was created by the word of God. Verse 4. In him, meaning in the word, was life. And that life was the light of men. The light John is speaking of here is not the physical light we can experience and enjoy through the sun, the moon, and the stars. John is speaking of spiritual light. In the beginning... Before sin entered into the world, God's creation enjoyed both the physical light of the sun, the moon, and the stars, but it also enjoyed spiritual light. The life which was in the Word was the light of men. The Word was the source of spiritual light. Before man's fall into sin, there was no spiritual darkness. Unfortunately, when sin did enter into the world, the world was plunged into spiritual darkness because man was separated from light and life. God had told the man and the woman that they would die if they were to sin, and they did. Their spiritual death was immediate. Their relationship with God, the one who had given them life, which had been perfect, was severed. Their physical death came many years later. So it was, after sin entered into the world, the world was plunged into spiritual darkness. Now, spiritual light continues to shine. Spiritual light cannot be extinguished any more than God can be extinguished. But we read in verse 5, the light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. Spiritual darkness cannot understand spiritual light any more than one who is spiritually dead can understand what it would mean to be spiritually alive. Darkness and death cannot understand light and life. These are mutually exclusive. When we come to verse 6, we come to a brief pause. In this pause, we hear, There was a man who was sent from God. His name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all men might believe. The John spoken of, in these verses is not the John who is writing the gospel account of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. No, the John of these verses is John the Baptist, or John the Baptizer. John the Baptist came as a forerunner to Jesus. He came to prepare the way of the Lord. He came as a witness. His sole purpose was to point to the one whom God was sending into the world, the one who was, and is in fact, the light of the world. John, our gospel writer, states that uh, John the Baptist's purpose was not only to be a witness to testify concerning the light, his witness was such that through him all men, all people, might believe. John the Baptist was actually the last of the Old Testament prophets. He was the last to the point to the one who was to come before he came, before Jesus came. When some of John's disciples came to Jesus, to inquire of him if he was the one promised in the law and the prophets. Jesus told them to go and tell John what they had seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the good news is preached to the poor. 
In verse 7 of Matthew's Gospel, we read, As John's disciples were leaving, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. Jesus said, What did you go out into the desert to see? A reed swayed by the wind? If not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No. Those who wear fine clothes are in king's palaces. Then what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet, this is the one about whom it is written, I will send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way before you. Most definitely, John was sent by God to prepare the way for the Messiah, to prepare the way for Christ. Next we read, he himself, meaning John himself, was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. John knew his role. He was a messenger. His responsibility was to prepare the way of the Lord. Once he accomplished that work, he no longer captures the limelight, so to speak, in the scriptures. We only hear about him again when he is arrested and when his death is reported. He had accomplished what the Lord had given him to do. In John 3, it is reported that an argument developed between some of John's disciples and a certain Jew over the matter of ceremonial washing. They came to John and said to him, Rabbi, that man who was with you on the other side of the Jordan, the one you testified about, well, he is baptizing and everyone is going to him. To this John replied, A man can receive only what is given him from heaven. You yourselves can testify that I said I am not the Christ, but am sent ahead of him. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine, and it is now complete. He must become greater, and I must become less. So John the Baptist was not the light. He came as a witness to the light. In verse 9 we hear, the true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. As wonderful as verse 9 is, and it is wonderful, verses 10 and 11 are not so wonderful. Because these two verses record the world into which the true light was coming. It was a world hostile to the true light as we now hear. Verse 10, he, the true light, was in the world. And though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. When we read, he came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him, these words refer to the fact that God was coming to his own chosen and covenant people. But his own people, the people he established for himself from Abraham and Sarah, did not receive him. They rejected him. This was indeed terrible. However, the news isn't completely bad because now we hear, Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The one thing needed to become a child of God is to receive the one God sent into the world and to believe in him. Nothing more is required. Becoming a child of God is that simple. Let's also notice the little word all, to all who receive him, to those who believed in his name. Becoming a child of God is readily accessible to every single person on earth. Again, the only thing needed is this, believe in the one God sent, receive him as Savior. Now this ends our interlude, our pause, which began at the end of verse 5. The pause which spoke of the baptizer's purpose and what we receive from God when we receive the one who came into the world. Because we had an extended break between verses 6 and 13, let's go back now and read verses 1 through 5 and then jump immediately to verse 14. So we have a continuum going. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. 
We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. The uncreated, eternal word of God who created all things became flesh. He took on our humanity in order that we might see the glory of the one and only begotten Son of God. Like his Father, Jesus was full of grace and truth. He was the perfect image and reflection of his Father. Later on, in John's Gospel, as Jesus is preparing his disciples for his departure, one of his disciples, Philip, says to Jesus, Lord, show us the Father and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered Philip by saying, Don't you know me, Philip, even after I have been among you such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. St. Paul, writing to the people of Colossae, wrote, For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. He is the firstborn over all creation. The Word became flesh. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory. The glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Maybe we don't realize it. But God wants to dwell with us. When God created humankind in the beginning, his heart's desire was to live with us. There wasn't ever supposed to be a separation between us and God. When sin entered into the world, God could not dwell with man because we could not live in the presence of a holy God and live. God did promise to send one who would restore what sin had broken, and the one God sent into the world is the one of whom we've been reading about in these verses from John's Gospel. The one who came was the Word himself, the one who created everything. This one came in human flesh. He came as one of us to accomplish what we could never have been able to do for ourselves. John describes Jesus, the Word that became flesh, God who became flesh as full of grace and truth. There was nothing lacking in Jesus. He was full of grace and truth. Next we hear John's testimony concerning Jesus, and that's verse 15. John testifies concerning him. He cries out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me, because he was before me. From the fullness of his grace, we have all received one blessing after another. John writes that Jesus was full of grace and truth, and from the fullness of his grace we have all received one blessing after another. Already we can begin to understand better what Jesus speaks of when he talks with the Samaritan woman at the well in John chapter 4. When speaking of the difference between the water she would be drawing from the well she kept coming to day after day, uh, and the living water Jesus had to give to her, and the living water Jesus has to give to all of us, Jesus said concerning that well that she was coming to every day, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water that I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. How could Jesus give to this woman and to all who would drink from him such a spring of living water? He could give it because it was coming from his own fullness. He could give it because it was coming from life which was in him. Blessing after blessing after blessing, one right after another, coming from the fullness of his grace, not because we deserve the blessings, but because God loves to bless. Then we read in verse 17, For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but God, the one and only, who is at the Father's side, has made him known. If we want to know God, all we've got to do is get to know his Son. And to get to know his Son, we just need to get into God's Word and learn who our Lord Jesus is. He wants to be known. He can be known. And he doesn't just want to be known about. He wants to be personally known. And he can be personally known. Because God, our Lord Jesus, is living. 
and he is able to be in a relationship with us. And so let's pray. Good and gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for John's gospel. We aren't that far into it, Heavenly Father, but it is already blessing us. So we thank you that you became flesh, that your word became flesh and lived among us. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for the fact that that's what your desire is. You, you want to dwell with us. You want to dwell with people. You created humanity so that you could dwell with us. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for your spiritual light that is continuing to shine in the darkness. We pray, O oh Lord, that more and more people would have the darkness that, darkness that is over them and surrounding them shattered by your, your wonderful, brilliant light. Heavenly Father, people who are in spiritual darkness, most don't even know it. Most aren't aware. They were born in darkness because we are all born in spiritual darkness. But we pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would be working in each and every person's life in order to bring light and life to each person. We thank you for your living word, and we thank you that your word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We thank you that when we look at Jesus, we're looking at you, Father. We thank you for that. We bless you. We praise you. We ask you to bless, O oh Lord, the, um, the study that we will continue to have throughout the Gospel of John. Again, we praise you and we bless you. And now I bless all of these people who have been listening. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and grant you his peace. Bye-bye and we'll see you next time. Thank you for joining Pastor Kathleen. Through this message, we hope that you will have come to know God better. God can be known and wants to be known by each person on earth. God is a communicator. He has given us the Bible his Son Jesus, and the Holy Spirit, as means through which he reveals himself and his will to us. God is love. And regardless of what is going on in your life, God loves you and is concerned for you. He is as near as a prayer, and he can be trusted to be faithful to you. Living Word is a listener-supported program. Your prayers and donations are needed to keep this program on the air. Donations can be through the Living Word website or sent to Living Word, P.O. Box 3810, Alice, Texas, 78333-3810. If you have a question you'd like to ask Pastor Kathleen, a comment you'd like to share, or would like to purchase a CD of this message, and have access to the Internet, Pastor Kathleen's website is www.livingwordradio.org. If you are in the area and would like to join Pastor Kathleen and the congregation she serves on the weekend, she is pastor of Emmanuel Lutheran Church in Alice, Texas.